is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and I hope you're getting excited because people are talking about a new bull market, and yeah, the juniors are popping, and they are rocking, and they are taking off, and... Gold is still at $1,800. We're going to check our metal prices here. A quick preview. It is at $1,800.20. So it maintains its $1,800 level at this point. It looked like it might have broke it a little bit yesterday, but I think if it sort of keeps up here, the technicians might let it slide. Interesting times. I remember remember former editor-in-chief John Cumming saying, so goes gold, so goes the miner. And uh, yeah, so you can subscribe today to the Northern Miner if you want to get all the latest information on those juniors. And that is our bread and butter. So take advantage of this unique, century-old, more than a century, since 1915, 105-year-old publication. It's a great editorial up there right now. So Yeah, that is happening, and fortuitously, we also have Jeffrey Christian, part two of his awesome interview that he did with Frick Ells, executive editor of Mining.com, and we started that last episode, and that was from the Canadian Mining Symposium that we held on Zoom from June 16th to 18th, so about a month ago, and yeah, the timing is awesome. Uh, it does look like we have a new bull market, and it's interesting. It's, I was listening to an interview with John Kaiser, the bottom fishing analyst. I think we've had him on the program here. And he's also mentioning this Robin Hood phenomenon. We talked about Tesla, I think it was last week, and it's gone up like $300 since then or 20 or 30% since then. Tesla is on fire, and people are attributing that to this Robin Hood app somewhat, not entirely, but that there is a lot of people that jumped into the market during the crisis and a younger generation, a new generation of investors. And John Kaiser, his research tells him that this is also happening. And so isn't that interesting? That really does have the hallmark of a new bull market when you get that retail investor involved now, I don't think you can get these juniors on Robinhood. I don't have the Robinhood app, but my impression is these are more big cap U.S. companies that you could trade on Robinhood. I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling you can probably buy GDXJ, the ETF of the juniors, and maybe indirectly that does funnel through. So lots to think about, isn't there, as we try and make our way through this interesting year And so we're going to have the second part of the Jeffrey Christian podcast, and he talks about commodities, even answers a question on tin, which is mildly humorous. So we have the rebirth of a new generation of retail investors. This is the thesis, the hypothesis. We don't know this for sure, but let's say. Then we have Jeffrey Christian in this interview talking about how asset managers, like only a small fraction of them have exposure to gold. And this is also an opportunity. You don't need to move the needle too much as far as asset managers exposing themselves to gold, which is one of the most popular investment ideas there are right now for things to really get interesting. Uh, He also talks about hydrogen engines, which is something that people don't talk about. It's kind of an interesting debate. I mean, some of the lithium guys don't like the hydrogen idea too much. But Jeffrey Christian has some really interesting things to say about uh, the potential for hydrogen engines. Uh, He also talks about manganese, which maybe doesn't get you too excited, but it shows the range of expertise that Jeffrey Christian has. Frick through a lot of diverse questions, uh, you know, and uh, Jeffrey Christian could handle them. I think the highlight, though, of the interview from just a general macro viewpoint was this idea that he, there's a quote, we see another global financial crisis happening maybe three to five years from now. And he seems to be talking about the system as a whole, whatever problems we have now are only going to be worse. And I think that's been borne out. I mean, 
whatever debts we had 10 years ago in, say, the great financial crisis, the GFC, as they call it, you know, the great recession, whatever term you want to use, in a sense, it does seem like whatever problems we had back then are worse now and probably will be worse in the future. He doesn't say we're destined for doom, but anyway, I'm going to let you listen to that. So that is coming up. Other than that, I hope you are having a great summer. If you want to do your research on those juniors, you can find us online at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. We appreciate all the retweets. And if you want to find us on Instagram, you can find us at the Northern Miner, where you can see some of our social distance shots that I'm having fun finding. And you can also find us on Facebook. LinkedIn and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts. We're getting nice growth in subscribers there. And you can also find us on Spotify and Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts and wherever podcasts are available. And with that, let's go to our final mining minute with Adrian Dance, Principal Metallurgist for SRK Consulting. Here's Mr. Dance. So joining us today is Adrian Dance who is Principal Consultant in Metallurgy for SRK Consulting. Adrian, I hear you have developed a new test related to metallurgy. Uh, can you tell me about that? Well, as we've said before, the, the biggest challenge we see facing efficiency in the plant is the grade. And if we can find ways to improve the grade, it would make things a lot more efficient. One of the things that's missing uh, in the industry is the ability in a small-scale lab test to assess whether or not methods to remove the waste can be successful or not. Sometimes that's screening, sometimes that sorting of some sort. How do we actually determine if a deposit is amenable to that? And that's an area we've been developing a test. It can be done on a small amount of material, can be done relatively cheaply. But the big thing is by including that test, we can consider deposits very early in the study stage, very much at the scoping level of study, which is really where we need to consider this. You know, projects that are a little bit low in grade, can we improve their grade and then move them on down the study stage to the pre-feasibility stage? And that is an area that we've been developing a test and we're being quite successful in looking at uh, deposits to upgrade them and improve their grade. Great. So at what point in the process should people uh, be calling you as far as if they're interested in this? Because we mentioned in an earlier episode of our Mining Minutes that people are a little late. So when should they contact you? Well, it sounds a bit like I'm tuning my own horn, but certainly the earlier the better, because then you can start looking at whether there's opportunities early. You can start defining the cutoff grade Maybe there's a potential to lower the cutoff grade. And when you do that, of course, your amount of material that you can mine is a lot larger. You've got a longer lifespan to run the mine and you can pay things off over a lot longer period. So the whole economics change when you actually start considering the potential to change the grade that exists in the ground. I mean, Mother Nature made the material high grade or low grade, but we can manipulate that using current technology. Okay, excellent. And speaking of Mother Nature, there are environmental benefits from this as well. With all the talk of ESG, you play an important role, or the metallurgist or the uh, mineral processor plays a pretty important role in that and in helping make a more environmentally friendly mine. Would, would you say that's correct? Absolutely. I mean, anything that goes into the plant that ultimately is going to be challenging environmentally, it's going to be a tailings material that's if it's going to be wet, if it's going to be finely ground, it's more difficult to store in the long term. And if we can avoid at all costs material going into the plant and rejecting it early on, we ended up with a reject uh, that's coarse, it's dry, it's stackable, it's storaged, it won't be generating any acid drainage issues, and it avoids the environmental problems of sending material into the plant. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Dance. That was a very interesting uh, discussion on metallurgy. So that's Adrian Dance, Principal Consultant in Metallurgy for SRK Consulting. And if you would like to learn more about Mr. Dance and his services, simply go to srk.com. And I will also post a link to his profile page in the show notes as well as to his LinkedIn so thank you, SRK, once again for supporting the program. And turning to the news, Chile is struggling to maintain copper production as coronavirus spreads. And we're going to see that in the metal price section that copper is really taking off. 
you're looking at Freeport, it continues to do very well. So copper is getting interesting. Now, is it the great reflation or is it this problem that Chile is having, the world's biggest copper producer, with the coronavirus spreading in their minds? It's a big Latin American problem. It's a big Western Hemisphere problem. We have a report from Tom as a party. One of our favorites here, workers at Chile's giant copper mines are caught between the urge to protect themselves and pressure to keep the country's economy moving. Since declaring a state of emergency in March to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, the Chilean government has tried to maintain a difficult balance between slowing the spread of the disease and shielding the economy through the inevitable downturn. Mining companies, the backbone of the economy, were urged to keep producing while taking drastic measures to reduce the risk of infections for employees. You see this also right now going on in the U.S. It's a huge political issue. Are the kids going to go back to school in the fall? Are teachers essential workers? So you see this debate happening in Chile, but with the government asking mining companies to keep going to keep the country's finances in order. Continuing on... As well as distributing face masks and alcohol gel and disinfecting work sites, companies have sought to ensure social distancing by dramatically reducing personnel on site, largely by suspending activities not essential to production, such as mine development, exploration, and maintenance. So here we are, what, four months later? I mean, we have all of March, all of April, all of May, and all of June. We're into month five of this coronavirus going global, and it just is relentless, isn't it? Work on major projects such as Tech Resources, Cabrada Blanca II, and an expansion of Antofagasta's Las Palambras mine was halted for several weeks while sanitary measures were worked out. By July, the number of mine workers on site in the country had fallen to 123,000, down 45% from the start of the year, Mining Minister Baldo Procurica told lawmakers on July 6. Despite the massive reduction in personnel, mine output appears so far to be holding up. The unions must be very concerned about that. Copper production during the first five months of the year hit 2.4 million tons, up 3.5% from last year, largely reflecting the impact of flooding and maintenance shutdowns on output during the early part of 2019. So I guess we could conclude from that that it's not that 2020 is so great, it's that 2019 was so terrible because of these maintenance shutdowns and flooding. Data produced by the Chilean Copper Commission, Cochilco, a government agency, showed that production had risen at most mines this year. Only Anglo-American, among the country's leading producers, had reported a steep fall down 17.9% year-on-year in the first five months of the year, reflecting a water shortage at its Los Bronques operation. So interesting, it's not coronavirus related. By the end of 2020, the government estimates Chile's annual copper production will fall by 200,000 tons from last year's output of 5.8 million tons. All things considered, I would think we can call that a negligible reduction, but things get interesting here. So production itself is, I think we could call it pretty good, only down a little bit. Here's a quote from Juan Carlos Guayardo, head of Santiago-based industry consultancy plus mining. At least until two weeks ago, the industry appeared to achieve a good balance between health and economic concerns. End quote. And back to as a party. However, since mid-June, a rise in the number of infections among mine workers has put Chile's strategy under severe strain. From a couple of hundred in May, the number of workers infected with the disease is now fast approaching 5,000, and this is the number that really turned my head, or more than 2% of the total workforce. So my bet is that 2% of the population is not infected in Chile, but you have 2% of the workforce, which would mean, and this is all speculation on my part, but which would mean these sites, you're more likely to get infected if you're working at one of these sites than not. Let's put it that way. Some clusters are reaching alarming levels. In the O'Higgins region, home to the giant El Teniente mine, more than 6% of miners have been infected, according to ministry data. The situation in the mining industry mirrors the development of the pandemic nationally. So here they're saying it mirrors it. President Sebastian Piñera has been preparing to reopen schools and shopping malls before the number of new cases reported daily jumped from a few hundred in April 
to a few thousand by mid-May. Instead, strict lockdowns were quickly imposed across Santiago and other major cities, and the 90-day state of emergency has now been extended until September. So second wave, first wave continued, whatever you want to call it, this is getting pretty serious again, as it always was, but we definitely had a bit of a lull, at least in terms of the sentiment, about a, six weeks ago, two months ago. With reports of the first deaths of mine workers from the disease, 12 have died so far, according to the mining ministry. Unions began demanding management and government take more drastic measures to protect members from infection or risk workers walking out. And we have a quote from Patricio Elgueta, the top union official at state-owned mining firm Cadelco, and he told the Northern Miner, quote, if there are operations which cannot meet the minimum legal standards, then they must be closed. Fearing an acceleration of the outbreak and wildcat stoppages, mining companies have stepped up their efforts to slow the rate of infection. Since June, Cadelco has halted all construction projects at its operations in northern Chile, including a new underground mine at Chuquicamata, and shut the smelter at the mine. It is also pledged to use only local staff at the complex. At El Teniente, Cadelco's largest by production, the company has switched to 14 days off and 14 days on shift cycle, giving more time for sick workers to be identified before they return to work. Construction of the new mine level, a multi-billion dollar investment vital for sustaining output for decades to come, has also been suspended. And finally, multinationals have followed suit. BHP has announced that workers at its Spence mine would no longer move through the Kalama Airport, which normally handles thousands of fly-in, fly-out mine workers every week. Such measures show that Cadelco and other mining companies are putting the health of their workers above all other considerations, says Cochilco's executive vice president, Marco Riveros. So you can read the full report at northernminer.com. We looked at only half of it here, and it's pretty intense as the coronavirus continues to ravage Latin America. Switching gears, we are returning to the Porgeras story. You might remember that Barrick and Zijin Mining had a dispute with the government of PNG over what I would call ESG concerns. The new prime minister canceled the mine license abruptly based on protests from the locals who were not happy with Barak and Zijin. Apparently there's a bit of a history there. I don't know it exactly there. And so there is an update on this story. And Cecilia Jamazmi, Mining.com. Barrick Gold has served a dispute notice to the Papua New Guinea government over the country's refusal to renew a license for the Porgera mine. The world's second largest gold producer says that PNG's decision to reject the application for the lease extension violated a bilateral investment treaty between the country and Australia, as well as international law governing foreign investment. So I assume that we could read that Barrick's affiliate there, which is called Barrick New Guinea Limited, is based out of Australia. I think we could assume from that because Barrick is saying that the prime minister's decision to not renew the mining license violates an investment treaty between the country and Australia. That's an interesting difference, isn't it, between what we're seeing from those kind of sketchy newspapers uh, that were saying that the Chinese government was simply threatening PNG through those newspapers. One is assuming. I mean, it's all very shadowy. Uh, but here it's quite clear. So this is the tack that Barrick has taken. Kind of a less threatening tack, but just more of a legal argument. Barrick and its Chinese partner, Zijin Mining, temporarily halted operations at the mine in Enga province in late April. The move followed Prime Minister James Marape's refusal to renew Pergara's permit on environmental and social concerns. In May, the gold giant offered an extra 15% stake in the Porgera mine to local landowners in a fresh attempt to break the impasse with the government over the mine's future. This is a tact that I'm seeing quite regularly now, which is you give a lot of money to the local people, and this kind of makes everyone be quiet. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure what to make of that. It seems like it could be fraught with some kind of ethical problems when you start taking those approaches. PNG later threatened Barrick with criminal proceedings, so obviously the government wasn't happy with that. 
claiming the company's joint venture in the country was planning to illegally export $13 million in gold and silver to Australia. Eric New Guinea Limited refuted the allegations. We touched on that in the earlier episode. And just another little detail on this story, Barrick revealed at the time that PNG was also asking the company in Zijin to pay $191 million U.S. in back taxes, rising from tax audits conducted between 2006 and 2015. And so there you have it. So I think the real update here is that Barrick is basically, for lack of a better term, hitting back. They have served a dispute notice to the PNG government over the refusal to renew the mine license. And here's another license that was canceled, GoviX, to appeal canceled uranium license in Zambia, also by Cecilia Jamazmi of Mining.com. GoviX Uranium says it will appeal Zambia's decision to terminate its Chirundu mining license. The company acquired the permit in 2017 from African Energy Resources, and it includes the Najame and Guabe deposits. Both assets, GoviX said, were subsequently included in the preliminary economic assessment for the company's Mutanga uranium project. Due to the smaller scale and higher cost nature of the two deposits, they were scheduled to be mined in the later stages of the PEA and were not included in the mine plan, GoviX said. They also said that Nijame and Guabe, their exclusion is expected to have low to no impact on the project economics. And let's just get the quotes since acquiring the Chirundu mining permit, Gavix said it had, quote, ensured all statutory reports and payments, end quote, were made. It also noted it had expanded its community and social responsibility programs to cover the villages within the Chirundu licenses, including the reconstruction of a school and the commencement of an adult education program. I wonder if they had built those yet or if those were just in the plan. Sometimes that makes a difference. We have a quote from Chief Executive Daniel Major, quote, we are disappointed by the decision made by the mining cadastre with regards to the Chirundu license and do not believe this decision is fair or in the interests of our Zambian stakeholders. And under the Zambians Mine and Minerals Development Act of 2015, GovX has 30 days to appeal the decision. So another mining license canceled. Interesting. This one I just want to touch on the headline more than anything. Uh, Rubicon Minerals fabled Rubicon Minerals, which had all sorts of issues with their Phoenix deposit. They have changed their name to Battle North Gold, and this is from Canadian Mining Journal staff. And now Battle North Gold has renamed their Phoenix project to the Bateman Gold project. So what was Rubicon Minerals is now Battle North Gold, and what was Phoenix is the Bateman Gold project. So they are doing a rebrand, and that is probably a good idea because... There are only so many bad news stories you can have before you start to just need to start fresh. Moving on, we got this great story from Kelsey Rolf for the Northern Miner. Baffin Land Iron Mines and Inuit Association strike landmark agreement. A new multi-million dollar agreement between Baffin Land Iron Mines and Kiki Katani Inuit Association, QIA, that includes a substantial royalty increase, Inuit oversight of environmental monitoring, and direct community benefits may have set a new standard for Indigenous involvements in mining projects. The party's Inuit Certainty Agreement, ICA, will see the QIA's royalties from Baffinland's Mary River Iron Ore Mine on Baffin Island in Nunavut increase from 1.19% currently to 1.5% once the mine's expansion is operational and eventually to 3% over a five-year period. Local Inuit communities will have substantial say in the mine's operations under the agreement with new overstate responsibilities of Mary River's environmental impact on land use and harvesting, as well as potential changes to community life, such as food sources and security. The monitoring program will contain specific thresholds with actions for Baffin land to take if they're exceeded, the Inuit Oversight Committee will also ensure Inuit Kwaji Majatukangit, or traditional knowledge, is respected and incorporated into the project. You know, this partnership sounds like it's ongoing and subject to ongoing assessment and evaluation. Continuing on, the agreement will see Baffinland make a one-time $1.3 million payment to the Minty Metallic Hunters and Trappers Organization in Pond Inlet to compensate for changes to their hunting experience over the mine's life. So a little cash injection to the community. 
It also gives the QIA the ability to identify water bodies affected by Mary River and determine compensation amounts for the communities under an existing water compensation agreement. And QIA President P.J. Akiagok says, quote, to our knowledge, that's very minimal, if even any agreements where an Indigenous organization has that capability in terms of influence. And he said that to the Northern Miner, and he continues, it's right to the core of the operations of the company. Obviously, Baffin Land does have the license to operate. That's why they're there. But that ability for Inuit knowledge to be incorporated into the operations of the mine is significant. He also says, Inuit for many years have been seeking to really own that space in terms of research, and playing a key role in monitoring. When we started discussions with Baffinland in terms of the ICA, the focal point was how we put Inuit in the driver's seat of the project. And he also says that the agreement provides a, quote, huge shift in Inuit employment targets, and Baffinland will compensate local communities if it fails to meet those requirements. So now let's just get Brian Penny, Baffinland president and CEO's response. And he told the Northern Miner, quote, we were focused not only on community development, but the levers and mechanisms we can use to help improve our employment levels at Baffinland, our goal is to get as many Inuit as possible working at Mary River. In doing so, you need the proper infrastructure for training and skills development, but also household support. That fits with our vision of where we wanted to go. It was brought up by the QIA, but we 100% supported it. So you can read the whole article on northernminer.com. It's a good one and it's significant. Don't let that one pass you by by Kelsey Rolf, special to the Northern Miner. And with that, let's turn to metal prices. metal prices we'd like to thank our friends at infomine.com once again for providing us with these prices each and every week and on july 15th gold is at one thousand eight hundred dollars and twenty cents per ounce that is twenty four dollars higher than last week's quote silver is at nineteen dollars and four cents per ounce that is ninety nine cents higher than last week's quote big jump there Platinum is at $837.44. That is $13 higher than last week's quote. Palladium is at $1,989.16 per ounce. That is $63 higher than last week. And on July 10th, copper, Dr. Copper, is at $2.87 per pound. That is $0.14 cents higher than last week. So continuing to show strength. Aluminum also is two cents higher at 74 cents per pound. Lead is four cents higher at 84 cents per pound. Nickel is two cents higher at $5.93 per pound. Tin is six cents higher at $7.75 per pound. Cobalt is unchanged at $12.93 per pound. And zinc is five cents higher at 97 cents per pound. Everything is up. The great reflation continues and industrial looks strong. Everything looks strong. I don't think anything is down today. It's green everywhere. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, part two of our interview with CPM Group's Jeffrey Christian, who is managing partner. And he's been in this business for a long time. And I highly recommend for you to check out part one of our interview, which we posted last week. And this took place at the Canadian Mining Symposium, which we held on Zoom. And Jeffrey Christian was interviewed by Mining.com executive editor, Frick Ells, and they talk about commodities, hydrogen engines, and the potential for another financial crisis in only three to five years. I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. Questions from the audience. Bahid Sorabi, uh, excellent explanation on market behavior based on anomalous events. Would you please explain simultaneous decreasing trends on most commodities and gold during COVID-19 pandemic? I think commodities, you know, copper, lead, zinc, 
Uh, oil is a special thing because you have the Saudi-Russian oil price war going on. But I think commodities basically fell in price because of the shutdown in economic activity and the disruption in the supply chain for food to people and other things. So I, I think that the two things, gold fell and commodities fell for different reasons. It wasn't a coordinated decline. Gold fell at one point. I mean, and let's be honest, gold is at record prices and the average price this year probably will exceed the record av annual average price in 2012, which was the previous record. But gold did have this spike down. And then I think reflects the fact that A, there's a lot of gold around and B, over the last several years, a lot of investors had not been buying as much physical gold and silver as they used to. And even before the COVID-19 set in, you saw the physical demand for gold and silver coins and bars from long-term investors decline. Right. And it's very interesting. You, you did see a spike in March, and then it spiked down with the oil price, and then it spiked back up with the stock market. And it's actually at record levels. And we talk about the stealth bull market in gold because people keep saying, you know, when's gold price going to rise? Like, I'm sorry, but you know, it's at the same levels that it was at in 20, late 2011, yeah. early 2012, which was the record. It's there. I think it has further to go. But one of the things that you're seeing is investors, long-term investors who look at gold and silver as capital preservation instruments have not been buying as much. They came in and they bought a lot in March, and then they went away in April and May and the first half of June. And that's kind of worrisome to anybody whose exposure is to positive gold prices and silver prices, but it's the reality. And it's something that we've seen emerging really since 2017. And it continues even in the face of everything that's going wrong today. I have another question here um, on the fact that interest rates are, are basically zero. As large in institutional investors continue to search for yield, do you see an opportunity for miners to increase dividends? The miners are facing several problems in terms of raising money from institutions. And so there are some problems that are germane to the mining industry, which is yeah, they haven't paid the greatest dividends and they haven't had the greatest returns. And a lot of people are disenchanted with, with investing in mining because it hasn't done what they thought it would gold mining and other metal mining. But the the bigger problem for mining equity markets right now is that you have this massive amount of managed money and the, the asset management companies are moving away from investing in individual companies, especially smaller capital companies. Right. And you know the mining industry is a small cap company. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so you have these large asset management companies that say we're moving to AI, we're moving to ETF and indexed funds instead of individual companies. We're not going to spend as much time looking at individual companies and investing in individual companies. You'll have some portfolio managers who are still working for funds at those companies. And they say, well, you know, we'd like to buy CPM Group's research and you know, we like to be fundamentally driven. And you're finding that they're not. We did a couple studies over the last couple of years. One was commodity fund managers and hedge fund managers who invest in futures. And what we found was, if I remember correctly, there are 6,800 fund managers and 132 of them invested in precious metals. The rest were financial futures. And of the 132, 35 of them based their buy and sell decisions on fundamentals economics and the rest were technicians. And then we did another study on the Canadian junior mining industry. And what we found was a tremendous movement away from investing in small cap companies and individual companies and the mining industry. So a lot of the headwinds that the mining industry is facing and will continue to face in terms of raising equity from institutions transcends anything the mining industry can do. The buy side of the financial markets is just moving away from that. Here's a good one, and uh, you have to choose, and there can only be one. Which commodity in particular that you think will have a lot of potential opportunity for growth as the world deals with and recovers from COVID? Growth in price or growth in demand? <laughs> I think that copper has a great potential to rise in demand, but the price effect may be delayed. So we see the copper price relatively flat to slightly higher over the next 12 months with some increase in prices 
beyond the middle of 2021. I happen to like gold a lot because I do think that there will come a time, and it may not be 2020, 2021, but I think there will be a time in the next five years where things get really nasty in the global economy. Not like it is now, but even worse. And I think that you'll see a lot of investors moving back to gold, both for capital appreciation, which is what's driving the price higher now, but also for capital preservation. Uh, another one from Raziel Zisman. What are your views on the impact of new technologies, autonomous vehicles, storage, batteries, renewable energy on commodities in terms of increasing resources by de facto and lowering op costs, which would compensate for lower average grades? I mean, that's an interesting one. And there's a, in the book that you mentioned, Commodities Rising, not the electric vehicle book, but the, the Commodities Rising book, we talked a lot about the fact that you've seen this tremendous growth in demand and consumption of, of energy and agricultural commodities and demand for, for metals and minerals. You've seen this enormous growth over the last 120 years as the world has industrialized ever, on an ever-increasing basis. But the real prices of many of these commodities have fallen. And one of the reasons is because the technology that allows you to beneficiate the metal and grow more uh, crops per acre or hectare, the, the technology on the supply side has allowed for lower grade materials being produced and increased production. So I think that that's one of the factors that's in there. I do think there's going to be a number of technologies coming along. Miniaturization of a lot of things are going to hit some of the metals. But, you know, people are still going to want full-size houses and full-size meals and full-size vehicles. And an autonomous vehicle is probably going to have more metals in it because it's going to have a lot more electronics in it. Right. We've been paying a lot of attention to hydrogen because we think that hydrogen could be the fuel of the future. And we're looking specifically at what they call liquid organic hydrogen carriers, which is a safe and affordable way to ship, store, and distribute hydrogen. You know, it's very expensive and dangerous to you to use hydrogen in a compressed uh, or frozen form. But if you use liquid organic hydrogen carriers, you can ship and store the stuff at, at, at one atmosphere pressure and ambient temperatures. Right. And that changes the economics of using hydrogen. That's decades away, though. Right. Uh, but I think that that could definitely have a major effect on a variety of metals. And uh, wouldn't that be especially, uh, or the PGMs, when you have fuel cell cars, they need uh, platinum, don't they? There are different fuel cell technologies. Uh, the technologies that are there that still use platinum use 1% of the platinum that they used 30 years ago, and they continue to thrift away. There are other technologies that don't use any platinum now. Right. So it's not clear that fuel cells will be a big, they're not, they're not going to be the, the industry savior for platinum industry. They could be a major, if not the major use 10, 20, 30 years from now. You know, my view is that we might see hydrogen engines, which would be devastating for a lot of metals because they use fewer components. Uh, right. They're a much more stripped down internal combustion engine than you use for diesel or petroleum. And they would preclude the need for an exhaust uh, catalytic converter. So hydrogen engines, which are cheaper than fuel cells and more reliable than fuel cells, could be much more devastating for metals than, than other technologies. Yeah, I can remember quite a few years ago that when lithium iron in cars weren't really all that much talked about and the future was, was going to be hydrogen you know, from the start and lithium iron sort of took over that conversation. You said it's, it's, it's a while away. Give us some uh, rough, rough idea. Can there be a breakthrough that says, you know, let's forget about lithium iron, let's go straight for fuel cells? I think if you talk to the auto industry, they're spending, you know, it's very funny because the platinum people say, well, the auto industry is spending a lot of money on fuel cell research. Uh, the lithium and the cobalt and the manganese guys, well, the auto industry is spending a lot of money on electric vehicle research. And the reality is the auto industry is spending a, a lot of money on research across potential future propulsion technologies. And they're not really wedded to anything. The hydrogen engine makes sense. It was demonstrated to the auto industry, Ford and BMW were working with the company mm -hmm. around 2006, and they demonstrated the efficacy of it. And that one could go fast. I mean, the company that we're working with is interesting because they have the breakthrough. Liquid organic hydrogen carriers have always been sort of science fiction. And there are some companies that use it for stationary power storage. You can generate electricity with 
nuclear or solar or wind, and it's off peak, so you store it in by by using that electricity to create hydrogen from water. You store it, and then you use that hydrogen when you you need the power. But those carriers only hold like one or two percent by weight of the hydrogen. And for motive transportation, you need 6% or more. And the company that we discovered has a family of molecules that are 6% to 11% content, which makes them suitable for motive transportation. And that changes everything then, because all of a sudden you can ship the stuff, store it, and distribute it using the existing infrastructure that you use for petrol and diesel. And you can even burn it in a diesel engine. So it, it, it radically changes everything. And, and so from that perspective, if everything went well, you could start seeing these things introduced three to five years from now. Right. Typically, you'd see, say, you know, 10 years from now, we'd expect to start seeing significant introduction. Um, we have a question on the on cobalt. Where do you see that going uh, in the in the nearer, more medium term? Obviously, all the manufacturers are trying to thrift away cobalt uh, due to all what is going on, um, and some with more success than others. But more medium term, what what is happening in uh, in the cobalt market, and specifically? you know, considering the DRC and the Congolese government is now trying to set up a central selling organization for the artisanal miners, um, changes like that, could that have a huge impact? I'm not sure that those changes will have a huge impact. I think uh, it's a combination of factors. I mean, again, one of the key factors is to look at what the battery industry is doing. And, you know, like I said, they're moving from 20% cobalt sulfate to 10% cobalt sulfate over the next few years in their formulation. So I think that what you'll see is that the demand will not come along as strongly as a lot of people thought. And it also will come along more slowly than a lot of people thought. And that will apply some downward pressure on the prices. And at the same time, there is a lot of cobalt out there. It's, it's expensive to get at. So I think that there's a ceiling that's applied there too. I wouldn't be surprised to see the cobalt price hang up relatively well over the next three to five years. But I think on a longer term basis, say five to 10 years, the cobalt price will probably be lower than it is today. When people talk about cathodes, manganese is almost a, an afterthought. Sometimes everybody's cobalt and lithium and uh, all the rest, uh, nickel. Tell us a bit more about manganese and, and what can EVs do for manganese? Manganese is important to EVs. You know, what you, a lot of people, it's very funny because yeah, some of our competitors now have recently discovered that manganese sulfate is used in lithium ion batteries. We've been doing manganese research for the electric vehicle battery sector for at least, I don't know, a lot of years. <laughs> I, I don't know how far back it goes, but it goes back many years. And you, you need high purity manganese sulfate for that. And the thing about manganese is that the manganese market right now is probably more than 95% is ferromanganese and manganese or for the iron and steel industry. And the amount of manganese that might be used for electric vehicles might go from one or 2% to 5% of the manganese market, maybe 10% of the manganese market. So it's going to be important, but it's probably not going to be ch radically change the price for manganese ore or ferromanganese because that industry and that market is so much larger than the electric vehicle market. So the manganese is very important to the electric vehicles. The electric vehicles may not be so important for manganese, uh, but it is significant there. And the real money will be made making the high purity manganese metal and high purity manganese sulfate. Here's a question on a uh, metal we don't maybe wrongly so, don't speak so much of, and that is tin. Uh, give us the skinny on tin. I, you know, I'm not all that much on tin. I yeah, haven't thought that much about it. You know, I believe our expectation is that the tin price will probably pretty much move sideways for a while. Like all the other industrial metals, it's really been hit by the shutdown in industry. It'll come back a little bit. It remains heavily dependent on Indonesia, and Indonesia is struggling to its natural resource issues. I don't really have too much of a view on tin. So maybe as a as a last question, we got I think four minutes or so left. I'm going to bring it back to gold. 
I know you have at CPM, you have a fairly unique way of not calculating prices, but uh, viewing prices and projecting prices. Uh, can you give us a, a glimpse of uh, what you expect for gold, let's say a year from now? Is there something that can, gold is doing well, is there something that can fundamentally change what seems to be quite rosy prospects? So our view on gold prices is that the price rises, well, we're now moving into the summer months and we wouldn't be surprised to see the price move sideways, maybe even show some weakness in July and August. But then over the course of the rest of this year and into 2021, we expect the gold price to rise so that the average price, you know, a year from now probably will be 1800 or maybe a little bit higher. Again, you're at record prices already, even if the world doesn't realize it. So we think that that's going to happen. And then at some point, as I, I alluded to, we see another recession and another global financial crisis, maybe three to five years from now. And we think that at that point, it's much more severe because all of the problems that we have now would be just that much worse. And in that kind of environment, we think that the gold price could rise sharply to record level, further record levels like $2,000, $2,200 an ounce is possible. What could go wrong to upset that view is that the world could get better. And I'll try not to laugh, you know, but I mean, it's very frustrating to me, you know, but in the United States, we talk about the deficits, we talk about the social security system, and you look at the economic imbalances that are likely to drive the world into a worse situation and drive gold prices higher, and they actually could be dealt with, but the political will's not there. I, I, you know, I was working on a presentation last weekend and I showed my wife. In 1947, the U.S. federal debt as a percentage of GDP was about 120 or 127 percent, something like that, mm -hmm. much higher than it is today. And we paid it down from 1947 to 1981. We mm -hmm. did that with a marginal tax rate that initially was 91 percent, right. and then it went to 61 percent. And in 1981, uh, the Reagan administration made it 28%. And it started rising. And they also started spending. You know, I've never understood the political. The Democrats aren't like a real party. You know? <laughs> and so the Republicans say that the Democrats are a party of tax and spend. And the Democrats have never said, yeah, and you're just borrowing spend. But yeah. if you look at budget deficits, they explode when the Republicans have the White House. And they, you know, and they did from Reagan through George H. Bush. And they did again through George W. Bush. Clinton actually ran a surplus and paid down like a trillion dollars in debt right. in the last four years of his administration. It can be done relatively painlessly and relatively efficiently, just the same way it was done from 1947 to 1981. Right. But the political will is just not there. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that we're definitely just papering over our problems at the moment. Mm -hmm. And gold is a hard asset, so hard assets, you know, paper, rock beats paper, or paper beats rock, I don't know. Well, it's, debt is like nicotine, it's very addictive. And, and you'll find any number of governments that say, we'll start paying down our debt tomorrow. Right. Going to light up yet today. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. That was a great conversation. I hope to do at least an hour with you on uh, electric vehicles at some point. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'll be around. Does rock beat paper? Does paper, paper beats rock. Rick is right, paper beats rock. I have to remember that the next time I'm playing rock, paper, scissors. I hope you enjoyed that. Jeffrey Christian is always a joy to have on the program. And uh, I thought Rick did a great job interviewing him. And uh, thanks also to the questions that came to us on the Canadian Mining Symposium on Zoom. A unique event, which I believe we will repeat. And so with that, if you want to find us online, again, just go to northernminer.com. Feel free to share this podcast, leave a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Until next week, take care.